Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here to start the PhD defense of Paula uh, Pitombera Hayes. And I want to thank the, the committee uh, that's going to uh, sit in her defense, uh, Professor uh, Ian Gates uh, from uh, Calgary, uh, Professor Márcio Murad from the National Laboratory of Scientific Computing, Professor Federico Tavares from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and, and Dr. Marcos Machado from Petrobras. So I thank you all for, for taking the time and uh, to, to sit and, and learn about Paula's uh, work. Uh, the, theater, the, the title of the thesis is Development and Application of a Poor Network Model for Gas Condensate Flow. So Paula, uh, the floor is yours. You, you can give your presentation, which will be followed by questions from the committee. Um, okay, thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Paula. Um, as Martha just said, I will start the presentation of the work produced for, during my doctoral thesis entitled Development and Applications of a Poor Network Model for Gas Condensate Flow. So starting with a brief introduction, what motivated our work were the challenges in production from gas condensate reservoirs and what I have in particular is that they undergo a transition from single phase to two phase flow during depletion, which are explained using this phase diagram of the reservoir mixture and this reservoir well bore scheme. So if this arrow here represents the reservoir isothermal depletion, when we have high pressures, we are in the single phase region where there's only gas flowing from the reservoir to the well bore. At lower pressures, however, we enter the two-phase region where a condensate dropout takes place. So in the reservoir, far from the well, we still may have that single-phase gas flow, but close to the well bore, we shift to a two-phase gas condensate flow. And this is a problem because this condensate blocks many of the gas flowing paths and reduces a lot the well productivity in a phenomenon known as condensate blockage. So when you have this kind of reservoir, it is crucial to estimate the reduction in productivity so that we can assess the field of economic availability and define production strategies. Those uh, estimates are normally done with reservoir scale simulations to which a key input is the relative permeability curves. Here we have an example of those curves uh, as a function of the condensate saturation. Um, the reason why they are so important is because they contain the information necessary to quantify the condensate blockage. So uh, if you have a reservoir and we know the condensate saturation profile, we can know how much of the gas productivity is lost, how much of the condensate we can produce. So we need well-defined curves. And for gas condensate systems, there's a further complication, which is the fact that those curves, they not only depend on the saturation, but also on the interfacial tension between the phases and the flowing velocity. So for a given condensate saturation, instead of a pair of curves, we have multiple curves. Those curves, they normally are obtained with the following methods. First, uh, directly via co flooding experiments. Here we have an example of a core flooding setup. And the problem in this case is that uh, you need a high number of experiments since you have to get different curves for different flowing conditions. So, as an alternative, we can use core flooding experiments plus a correlation. And the idea here is to reduce the number of experiments required and to interpolate between immiscible curves and miscible curves using normally a function of the capillary number. But in this case, we still need experimental data. So uh, a third option is to generate those uh, curves via poor scale modeling. And in this case, if you have a model that is good enough, there's a possibility to avoid those complicated experiments. So in this context, our goal was to develop a poor network model to simulate gas condensate flow and to generate this kind of data for reservoir scale simulations. So before I introduce the model that we developed, I would like to go through some basic concepts regarding gas condensate flow in porous medium and also a brief literature review to contextualize our work. So the first key aspect of gas condensate fluids is the fact that the phases properties vary significantly with pressure. And this is relevant because when you have a producing well in the reservoir, we have an abrupt uh, change in pressure in the near well bore region. 
So this not only generates this uh, saturation profile as soon as the pressure becomes lower than dew point pressure, but also many other properties that affect the flow are altered. So for instance, if we analyze a point here that is relatively far from the well, we may see that the phases have similar properties and that the interfacial tension between the phases is also low. But as we approach the wall, uh, everything changes. We have much lower pressures. And what we see is that the gas tends to become less viscous and less dense. And the opposite is observed in the, the common sign. It becomes more viscous, denser, and the interfacial tension between the phases um, gets much higher. So it's important that we have a, a model that can account for those um, differences. And the second key aspect now concerning gas concentration flow in porous media is the phases distribution in the porous space. Because since we have the liquid formation in situ, uh, this phase distribution is different from that to obtained with conventional imbibition or drainage processes. So considering that geologic porous media are normally liquid wet, what we see is the development of wetting films upon condensation. This has been observed experimentally as seen in those uh, pictures here, in which as soon as the wetting phase separates from the bulk non-wetting phase, it goes to the walls and forms those, those films that we can see here or here. And then following this formation of wetting films, if the condensate saturation increases, we start seeing a cyclic opening and closing of gas flowing channels with condensate bridges. This has also been uh, observed experimentally as that has been pointed out by these arrows in those pictures here, in, in which the wetting film has evolved to form those bridges that intermittently block the passage of gas. So this phase configuration is very important, uh, meaning the formation of the widened films and this intermittent opening and closing of condensate bridges, because this is the reason behind the dependency of the relative permeability curves on interfacial tension and flowing velocity. So using this illustration here to explain it, if I try to establish a flow in this direction, uh, what we may see is that the gas uh, can be trapped behind those bridges if those bridges are stuck in place. And what holds those bridges in place is the capillary pressure, which can be calculated with a young Laplace equation shown here as a function of the meniscus curvature radii and interfacial tension. So in this case, if I increase the pressure drop in the sample, consequently increasing the flowing velocity, I might overcome the capillary pressure in some of, the, of those bridges and produce the gas that before was isolated in this gangway. And with this, we have a new configuration of the phases and the relative permeability of the gas is increased. And if instead of just increasing this pressure drop, we just reduce the interfacial tension, we would have a similar effect. So with these concepts in mind, we can go to the literature review of core network modeling for gas condensate flow. The, the first model was developed by Mohammadi and others in 1990. It was a quasi-static GD model for gas condensate flow. Then six years later, Fang and others, they, de they developed a different model. Now, just to calculate the critical condensate saturation under gravitational forces, uh, in the year of 2000, Lee and Kurozabari, they adapted this model proposed by Fang. And now uh, with the adapted model, they could uh, calculate relative permeabilities under gravitational and viscous forces. In the same year, Wang and Mohanji, they developed the first 3D for network model for gas condensate flow. And also they were the first to include the initial effects in the modeling. Uh, in the same year, Jamila Mari and others, they developed the first detailed single core model for gas condensate flow. And three years later, they adapted the single core model to a 3D for network model, and they were the first to validate the results against experiments. In 2017, Momei and others were the first to determine the phases properties with phase equilibrium calculations. And this is very relevant because before, uh, uh, all of those other works, they used constant properties for the gas and the condensate. 
And uh, finally, last year, Santos and Carvalho, they developed the first four network model for gas condensate flow with consistent uh, compositional formulation. So with that, we can go to the model we are proposing now. And our basic idea was to associate this compositional formulation proposed by Santos and Carvalho with a more realistic representation of both the forest media and the two-phase gas condensate flow. To develop this model, we use the following assumptions. First, the model is isothermal. There are only two phases allowed to flow, the liquid and gaseous hydrocarbon phases. Uh, we enforce local thermodynamic equilibrium at the network nodes. The porous medium is slightly compressible. There is no flow within borders, and we don't account for gravitational nor inertial effects. Uh, now we can move to the model geometric aspect. We use networks of converged and divergent circular capillaries. This uh, equation here gives us the radius of those capillaries as a function of the capillary length, the minimum radius of the capillary, which is in the constriction, and the maximum radius of the capillaries, which uh, is in the extremities. We have no restrictions regarding the network topology, so we can have both these irregular networks that are based on Poitier imaging or regular networks when this kind of information is unavailable. So if we zoom in on a small region of a network here, this is more or less what we would see. And in the intersection of those capillaries, we define the network nodes. We use the index I for the nodes in the formulation. And they're important because in the control volume of each node, we calculate the model variables during the simulations. And here we have what we call an edge. In the formulation, we use the index J for the edges. And they're important because they control the transport between those nodes. So to quantify this transport between the nodes, first we have to define the phase configurations and flow patterns in these capillaries. And that changes according to the saturation. So if you have a pressure that is above the dew-point pressure, we have a single phase gas flow. Then at lower pressures, lower than the dew point, we start having an annular two-phase flow in which the gas flows in the capillary center and the condensate flows adjacent to the capillary walls. And in this configuration, if the condensate saturation increases enough, we may reach a critical condition above which the sweating film configuration becomes unstable. Uh, and in our model, we consider that this um, condition for instability happens when we meet this criterion here, proposed by Beresnav, it's just a geometric uh, criteria, uh, criterion, and also when the thickness of the wet in film is above a minimum threshold. So when we meet these two criteria, we say that a bridge of liquid is formed in a phenomenon known as the Znepov, and while this bridge is accommodated in the capillary, the flows of gas and liquid are interrupted. However, once this bridge is formed, uh, it can be moved, which would allow again the flow of both phases if the pressure drop across this capillary exceeds a critical value. And to calculate this, sorry, and to calculate this critical value, we use this equation here, which is a function of the capillary uh, geometry, the saturation, and the interfacial tension between the phases. Um, so, to calculate this interfacial tension, we have implemented the Vinald and Katz correlation for interfacial tension, which is shown here, and is a function of the, some parameters that are determined in our flash calculations and also the parameter values for each component K in the mixtures we are simulating. And then, once we know the flow pattern, we can calculate the, the flow rate. So the volumetric flow rate in our model is calculated using the concept of hydraulic uh, conductance. So for the annual flow, we use those conductances here, which were developed for straight circular capillaries, and we adapt these conductances using this equivalent radius here. And for the case in which we have that bridge of condensate stuck in a capillary, we say that the conductances are equal to zero and that there is no flow. So for us to switch between those two stages, we use a function h and we multiply this function by, uh, by the 
uh, annular conductance. So if we have H equal to one, we have annular flow, and when the criteria for this bridge to be stuck in the capillary are met, we have H equal to zero. And with that, we can move to the mono governing equations. Um, we use the composition formulation based on the work proposed by Collins and others in 92. And in this formulation, the model variables are for every node i in the next rex, the number of moles of each component k and the pressure. And for the nodes that are located at the network inlet or outlet, we have those two plus a source or a sink term. So the first equation that relates those variables is the molar valence equation shown here. So this equation is a function of the a molar flow rate through the capillaries connected to each node. To calculate this molar flow rate, first we have that volumetric flow rate calculated with the conductance and we convert it to a molar flow rate using the phase uh, molar density and composition. And for those nodes that are at the inlet or outlet, we have the additional source or sink term. The second equation that uh, relates the model variables is the volume consistency equation, which basically matches the volume of the node with the volume of the fluids inside the node. So to calculate the node volume, we use this uh, equation here. It is a function of the medium's compressibility and the volume of reference at a pressure of reference. So using this information here, we can calculate the volume of this node at any pressure. And to calculate the volume of the gas and condensate inside the node, we use this equation here, in which this first part gives us the volume of the condensate and the second part gives us the volume of the gas. So by equating those two, we have the volume consistency equation. So with that, we form our system of equations. So here is the molar balance equation volume consistency equation and those simple equations here used to impose the boundary conditions, which can be either imposed molar flow rate or imposed pressure. Uh, this forms a big system of nonlinear equations, which is solved with the newton raphson method. And that it iteration of the Newton method, we perform the phase equilibrium calculations, which involve uh, a flash at constant pressure and temperature using the penguin robinson equation of state. So uh, with that, uh, we finished the model presentation and we can go to the results section, which was split into two parts. First, uh, I'll present the model validation and then some model applications, which will be uh, an evaluation of wettability alteration in gas condensate reservoirs and an evaluation of gas injection in gas condensate reservoirs. So starting with a model validation, we try to validate a model using experimental data from the literature. And this data involved relative permeability curves obtained by injecting a mixture of methane and normobutane in a brace and stone core. To reproduce this data, we used a network of 20 by 25 by 25 nodes. It was built on a regular 3D grid with coordination number equal to three. And the coordination number is the number of four roads connected to each four body. So to generate this network first, we started with a completely regular network, which has an average a coordination number of six. And then we randomly removed some of those edges to achieve the coordination number of three. To assign the, the size of the capillaries, we used the four thread size distribution that we had for the core used in the experiments. And we assigned this distribution to the minimum radius of the, of the capillaries. To define the maximum radius of the capillaries, we didn't have any, any data specific to this core. So we use uh, the aspect ratio of another very sample. And the aspect ratio is the ratio between four body radius and four throat radius. And finally, the flowing conditions that we had to reproduce, they involved three different gas flowing velocities of nine, 18 and 36 meters per day, and two different values of interfacial tension. 
0 0.015 and 0 0.037 millinewton per meter. So starting with the results for the lowest tested interfacial tension, here um, are the results. Those are the curves for the gas flowing velocity of nine meters per day, here 18 and 36. In those curves, we can see in red, the curves that were obtained by our model, in black, the experimental curves, and in blue, the curves that were obtained with using a different for network model from the literature. And by looking at those graphs, the first thing we can see is that the positive effect of velocity was well represented. When we shift from the lowest to the highest gas flowing velocity, the experimental curves have shifted upwards. And our model curves have shifted more or less by the same amount. So this effect was well represented. Also, we can see that the overall values match uh, for all the modeled and experimental curves. And for those two cases here uh, in particular, the nine and 18 meters per day, we can see that the other four network model from the literature, they rep it represents better the experiments than our curves. But they use some parameters designed specifically to fit this case here with the lowest velocity. So that may justify these differences. And another thing we noticed was that we overestimated the gas relative permeabilities at low condensate saturations, especially at those first two points here of our gas relative permeability curves. And this may have happened because of our choice of aspect ratio. The, the data we used was not directly linked to the core used in the experiments and the average aspect ratio was 1.5, which is relatively low. So if we had a higher aspect ratio, we would have more snap-off at lower liquid, liquid saturations. So we would have more condensate bridges and probably lower gas relative permeabilities at those points. And that could improve the results. And now the results for the highest tested interfacial tension. Here are the three graphs for the same velocities. And in this case here, with a gas flowing velocity of 18 meters per day, we could compare uh, our curves with experiments, the other model in blue, and yet another model in green from the literature. And now when comparing those three graphs here with the ones from the previous slide, we can see that the effect of interfacial tension was also uh, well represented. Those curves have lower uh, relative permeabilities, and that was expected since the interfacial tension increased. Um, also, the positive effect of rate was well represented again, and the overall values match. And for this uh, value of interfacial tension in particular, I think that our model has um, outperformed the other two models. Uh, the blue model has been um, just uh, using like parameters to to fit the other interfacial tension and probably those parameters are not very good for this interfacial tension here. And since we don't use this kind of, of parameters, I think the hours uh, have represented better the experiments. And finally, um, we also noticed that we have consistently, both here and the previous slide, overestimated a bit the condensate relative permeabilities. And this probably happened because we modeled condensate flow as stream flow on smooth capillaries. And this is not very realistic. So probably including the effect of wall roughness could potentially improve the results. And just to finish the validation section, we ran also some result analysis using this case here as an example. And the first thing we looked into was the number of capillaries blocked by condensate bridges since this might be the main mechanism of condensate blockage. So when we analyze point by point, we notice that indeed in those first two points, we have a very low percentage of blocked capillaries, which explains why our curve is above the experimental curve. And then as the condensate saturation increases, this number also increases very fast. And the second thing we analyzed was the composition variation in the, in the networks. Because since uh, as the liquid saturation increases, we see a buildup of the heavier components in the mixture. And in this case, since we only have methane and normal butane, the heavy components is have normal butane. 
So again, if we analyze point by point, we can see that here we have in the network 22% of normal butane, here 23 and a half, here 25.3. And with this increase of heavy components, this phase envelope of the mixture is shifted to the right. And so much that in the last two points, we see a transition from uh, the behavior of the mixture from gas condensate to volatile oil. So moving to the validation conclusions, uh, we believe that the results have showed good quantitative agreement with experiments. The model represented well the effects of artificial tension and flow velocity on the curves. Uh, also a relationship between condensate bridge formation and condensate blockage was identified. And also that uh, accumulation of heavier components was quantified and the transition from gas condensate to volatile oil occurred at high liquid saturations. And just as a reference, those results uh, were uh, published this year in this article indicated here. So now we can move to the application section uh, of the results. Uh, starting with the evaluation of wettability alteration in gas condensate reservoirs. So starting with a brief introduction, this year, this year method objective is to alter the wettability in the near wellbore region towards a gas wet state. And with that, we aim to reduce liquid accumulation and the blockage of gas flow. Most studies that try to evaluate this method, they perform imbibition or drainage for flood testing using air and water or air and oil as the fluid system. And this happens because it's really complicated to perform experiments with actual gas condensate fluids. Uh, however, this is inadequate to represent gas condensate flow. The phases, distributions in the pore space is different. Also, the interfacial tension tend to be higher. So for this reason, we wanted to adapt the proposed for network model to predict the effects of wettability on gas condensate flow. And the reason we had to adapt our model is because the phase configuration and flow pattern, they depend a lot on wettability. We knew that for liquid wet media, we would have this formation uh, this of wet in fumes and then this snap off of the non wet in phase but we didn't know what happened in gas wet media. So we decided to look into visualization experiments of condensation flow on gas wet glass capillaries. And what we uh, could read in this literature is that in liquid wet media, indeed, we have this film wise condensation followed by annular flow, but in Guess what media, something completely different happens. We would have a dropwise condensation followed by slope flow. So what this means is that upon condensation, the condensate is collected in droplets that do not spread on the walls nor flow. So they grow until they spend the entire cross section of those capillaries and then they are advected by the gas developing uh, a slope flow. So we had to assign this different gas wet behavior to the cases we simulated with a contact angle above 90 degrees. Uh, just summing up the gas wet behavior, we would consider a dropwise condensation, then the formation of this liquid slug without fume on the capillary walls, and then these phases would flow with the same velocity, which would prevent liquid accumulation. So to implement this, we use those conductances uh, for a slug flow. And also for all wettabilities in the model, we just corrected the calculation of the critical pressure drop to unblock a capillary to include this cosine of the contact angle. So uh, with the model adapted, here are the parameters that we use to evaluate this Euro method. So we adopted a sandstone-based network, as uh, shown here, with an absolute permeability of 169 milliedoncy a porosity of 17%, and the total volume of 1.75 cubic millimeters. Here we have the histograms of the maximum and minimum radii of the capillaries. To uh, study the wettability, we used a contact angle of zero to represent the original wettability of the rock and contact angles varying from 45 to 135 to represent the rock after treatment.
we also analyze many different uh, values of gas flow and velocity from seven and a half to 150 meters per day. And we used this uh, mixture here to represent the reservoir fluid. It has seven components. And the simulations um, were carried out at 80 degrees Celsius. And in this uh, range of pressures here between those two arrows, so we had pressures from just below the dewpoint pressure until the pressure in which the maximum liquid dropout took place. So moving to the results of this section, we use something called improvement factor to uh, measure how much the, the gas flow has improved or not after the treatment. So the idea behind the improvement factor is to compare the gas relative permeability of the treated rock uh, with the gas relative permeability of the untreated rock with the same flowing boundary conditions. So if we found uh, an improvement factor above one, we would have flow improvement. And if we found an improvement factor below one, we would see a flow impairment. And these are our results. Uh, each of those squares here, they represent a different variability. So here 45, 60, 75, 105, 120, and 135 degrees. The colors, the dark blue is 0 0.5, and this dark red is 2. And in those squares from P1 to P6, we had all the tested pressures in ascending order. And from Q1 to Q7, all the seven gas flowing velocities also in ascending order. So by analyzing those results, the first thing we could notice is that contact angles closer to 90 led to higher improvement factors. In this case here with 105 and here at 75. And that was expected since as we approach 90 degrees in the contact angle, we minimize the capillary pressure. So we minimize phase dropping. Also, we noticed that at lower pressures, we had also higher improvement factors. The lower pressures are in the left side of each of those squares. And this happens because at lower pressures, we have more liquid and higher interfacial tensions. So those are the cases that without the treatment, we have the worst conditions for gas to flow. So once you uh, implement this treatment, we have good re uh, results. And now just analyzing the gas wet cases, we realize the, those three bottom squares here. Uh, we realize that there's a more significant rate effect. And this happened because while in the liquid wet cases, we may have some capillaries blocked by the condensate, but some capillaries are still flowing in annular configuration. In the gas wet cases, all capillaries can potentially be blocked by those liquid slugs. And since the rate effect uh, lies on this blocking on and then blocking of capillaries, in this case here, we have a more significant rate effect. And finally, we also could see that for those cases, we could have improvement factors below one, which indicates uh, flow impairment. And this happened uh, at low gas flowing velocities and high pressures. So at least those conditions, they are not predominant in the near Walbor region. And while they're possible, they're unlikely to occur. So as the partial conclusions of the evaluation of portability iteration to prevent condensate blockage, uh, we have that this ER method could lead to significant gas flow improvement, especially at low pressures, but the positive rate effect increased with wettability alteration to preferentially gas wet, that also preferentially gas wet media could lead to gas flow impairment for low and moderate gas flow velocities. And as future work in this area, I think that it would be interesting to try to implement a more gradual flow pattern transition between the liquid and gas wet media. Also trying to define the contact angle as a function of the system thermodynamic state, and also defining a minimum condensate saturation for slug formation in gas wet media. And just uh, as a reference, these results uh, were published last year in this article indicated here. So finally, the, the last part of the results section uh, is the evaluation of gas injection in gas condensate reservoirs. Uh, 
So the, the objective of this ER method is to promote partial or full pressure maintenance in the reservoir with gas injection and to revaporize the accumulated condensate. This uh, your method has been investigated through core flooding experiments and compositional reservoir scale modeling, but no core scale evaluation has been reported in the literature. So for this reason, uh, we had an idea to use the proposed core network model to evaluate condensate revaporization in porous media with gas injection. Then I'll explain the procedure we used to evaluate this your method. First, we used the same sandstone based network from the previous section, and we separated this procedure into three steps. First, condensate accumulation in the network, and then condensate revaporization with gas injection. So for the first step, we injected in this network this mixture here that represents the reservoir fluid until the condensate accumulated in the network. This procedure took place at the temperature of 60 degrees Celsius at, and at six different pressures to represent different levels of depletion in the reservoir. Then in the second step, we changed what we were injecting in the network to either uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane or ethane, both pure or mixed with 50% in moles with that reservoir fluid. And we analyze if that could uh, revaporize the condensates that were accumulated. Uh, and all of those injection, uh, injections took place at the same uh, molar flow rate of 10 to the minus 6 moles per second. And to justify this choice of injected gas mixtures, meaning the CO2 and 2 C1 and C2 to revaporize condensate, uh, we have chosen them because when mixed with a reservoir fluid, they display the significant reduction in the liquid saturation. And we can see this in this graph here of the liquid dropout as a function of the pressure. So in both of these graphs, we have in the solid gray line, the curve of the reservoir fluid, and in the dashed lines, the curve of the, the reservoir fluid mixed with these gases here, we have 50% in moles of these gases, and here 75% in moles. And we can see that in both cases, there's a significant reduction in the maximum liquid dropout. So those gases are a good candidate to revaporize condensate. So now, um, moving to the results of the section. Uh, first, we analyzed the condensate saturation reduction with injection of the tested gases after condensate accumulation. So here is one example of the graph so shown in this section. Uh, here we have the condensate saturation and here the injection time. So in the first region here in gray, we have the injection of the reservoir fluid. So we see this condensate buildup in the porous medium. And in the second section in the different colors we have in blue, the injection of nitrogen. In orange, the injection of methane. In green, the injection of CO2, and in pink, the injection of uh, ethane. This graph here were, was obtained uh, at a pressure of 21 and a half megapascal, which is very close to the dew point pressure. So this case here re represents high pressures. And what we saw at high pressures is that we have a fast revaporization of the condensate. We can see that right in the beginning of the injection of those gases, the uh, liquid saturation decreases abruptly and also that by the end of the second step all gases had great results. They all could significantly reduce the condensate that was accumulated in porous medium. Then as we reduced the pressure uh, we started seeing that the revaporization process became much slower and also that there was a greater contrast between the different injected gases. Uh, while CO2 and C2 still had like similar and good results, in this case here, the injection of methane left behind 10% of condensate and the injection of nitrogen left around 15%. And finally, at the lowest acid pressure, we had something completely different. The revaporization process became very slow, as we can see here. During the time we ran the simulations, I think I don't think we 
like reached near the steady state condition. And even for the best results, which were obtained uh, with injection of ethane, we still had around 18% of liquid in the first medium. So the, the matter was not very effective at this low pressure. And just to illustrate the efficiency of gas injection at different pressures, here we have the content of CO2 in the networks after gas injection. Here we have the six pressures we tested. And in bright yellow, we have high contents of CO2. And in purple, very low contents of CO2. So this yellow part of the network represents the volume that was swept by CO2 after CO2 injection. And we can see that from 22 megapascal down to 17.75, there was a progressive reduction in the volume swept by CO2, which indicates a progressive loss in efficiency of the method. And at the lowest tested pressure, 14.75 megapascal, we can see that most of the volume of the network was bypassed by the CO2 injection, meaning that this gas just found the preferential path and couldn't revaporize the condensate. Um, the second thing we analyzed during the gas injection was the recovery of heavy components. And this slide here, I'll show the quantification of decaying C10 and exadecaying C16 recoveries after injecting the tested gases, now both pure or mixed uh, with 50% in moles of the reservoir fluid. So here in the left, we have the results for the decaying and here exadecaying. We have the recovery uh, in moles, in the percentage of moles that were recovered from the network, and we have here all the tested pressures. And we could see that at high concentrations, all tested gases could recover well the C10. Those recoveries here, they are uh, proportional to the reduction in liquid from the networks, which indicates that those, all the tested gases could revaporize the C10 and produce it. But when we analyze the C16, we have a difference uh, in the case of the nitrogen injection. So this means that even though the nitrogen could reduce a lot the uh, liquid saturation in the network, especially at high pressures, it could not revaporize this component here. So the C16 continued trapped in the porous medium. And uh, finally, we also uh, tested the injection of those gases mixed with the reservoir fluid. And we realized that while for the CO2 and C2 cases, we still had a positive recovery of the heavy components. Um, the, the opposite was observed with injection of methane and nitrogen, and which means that once they are flowing in the reservoir mixed with the reservoir fluid, they were not able to recover the heavy components. So uh, as the partial conclusions of this uh, section of the evaluation of condensate recovery in porous media with gas injection, we have that gas injection can be an effective method to eliminate condensate banking, that injection of ethane and CO2 display the overall most favorable results, that the ore method was more effective at high pressures, and that the injection of methane and oxygen can lead to early condensation and be ineffective to recover heavy components when flowing mix with a reservoir fluid. As future work in this section of my study, I think that we should evaluate the effects of gas injection rate and porous media heterogeneity on the recovery of condensate and that also it could be interesting to try to adapt the model to include the diffusion uh, effects. And to wrap up the presentation, as final remarks, we have that a compositional dynamic for network model for gas condensate flow was presented. The model was validated by comparing numerical and experimental relative permeability curves at varying interface attention values and gas flowing velocities that besides the prediction of condensate blockage, the model can potentially be used to evaluate your methods for gas condensate reservoirs. And as future work in the model, I'd suggest uh, including the effect of all roughness on liquid film flow, expanding the model for polyhedral capillary cross sections, and maybe as asymmetrical for elements, 
and also comparing the model results with experiments performed with a greater range of parameters and especially involving the tested Euro methods. And to conclude, I would like to thank all the agencies that funded this work and everyone for watching. Well, thank you, Paula, for, for your presentation. Uh, we begin now the, 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 the session.